Today's video is sponsored by Curology. Use my link below to start your Curology journey today. Hey y'all, it's me, Gotha C, and welcome back to Hot or Hot. And today we'll be reviewing episode nine of RuPaul's Drag Race season 16. Our queens were challenged to create a neo-goth look that says Morticia meets Mugler using only white, gray, and black fabrics provided to them in the workroom, which means this was the third design challenge of the season. So welcome to RuPaul Andre Tim Gunn Charles's Drag Race, I guess. But to be clear, I'm certainly not complaining about another design challenge. I love them. So we'll be going queen by queen to break all of that down. Let's take a look at some online drama involving Elliot with two T's that ultimately culminated in her simultaneously cutting down her season 13 sisters and applauding her own political activism. And speaking of political activism, I guess RuPaul is also running for president or something. Like, did y'all see that mysterious Instagram post she posted? I'm RuPaul and I have an announcement of an announcement for the American people. Subscribe and be the first to find out what it is. Anyways, let's start this week's video with the drama. So this situation bubbled up on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, when a meme of the winner versus the real winner started to go viral in some of the drag commentary spaces. And some of them were funny, mostly harmless jokes like this one, where we have Jinx Monsoon as the winner and Serena Chacha as the real winner. But there are also some less popular opinions being shared through this meme format, like this one, which is essentially invalidating Jada Essence Hall's win against GG's, which I personally don't find fair or funny. Elliot with two T's though gets brought into this when somebody shares a post of Simone as the winner and Elliot with two T's as the real winner. And with Elliot not even being a finalist from this season, this was very obviously a joke, but Elliot seems to think this was a genuine fan wishing that she had won this season out over Simone. Reposted it with some teary-eyed emoji, the rock on symbol, some hearts and a kiss. And her reaction to this is, <laughs> it is meme levels of inability to read the room on so many different fronts, but this is not the roast of Elliot with two T's. I'm just sharing the news of what happened. So she reposts this and then Cornbread responds to her underneath saying, now Elliot, sugar, I don't think this means what you think it does. Elliot, I guess at some point caught on that she was actually the butt of the joke here and proceeded with a flurry of posts to her ex profile writing, y'all still corny and obsessed with me, LOL, logging back out of this wasteland. Y'all can't accept anything other than the lies y'all have all been fed. Maybe, just maybe, what is being said about me is being said by bad people, maybe? Continue y'all's foolishness and stupidity. And keep in mind, her last post to this platform, aside from the meme resharing snafu, was May of 2023, when she came on to say, y'all really still obsessed with me, hashtag canceled. But she goes on in further posts to say, apparently I'm one of the nicest people ever? Doesn't sound like I'm the monster everyone thinks I am? Check y'all sources, where she reshares a video of Gottmik from the season 13 era, basically saying she's generous and would give her the wig off her head if she wanted it. And this was followed with a reshare of a clip of Simone, also giving compliments to Elliot, saying that she's a nice queen. And if you're a little out of the loop here, the short of it is back during the season 13 era, she was called out for a couple of things, the biggest one being where she was saying Simone's drag was black girl magic, but not aggressive. And according to several members from the cast of season 13 had made insensitive comments about people in the trans community. All of which, by the way, she has apologized for over the years. But after she reshared the clips of Simone and Gottmik saying that she was a nice queen, she posts this. No one else from my season went to the US Capitol to fight for trans rights and stopping the drag bans. Again, really look at the people y'all are idolizing because they are not good people. Just because they are the loudest in the room doesn't make them right. I never in my life ever intended to hurt anyone. And if I did, I'm truly from the bottom of my heart sorry. But if I said something that I thought was being silly or trying to make a connection and it came across wrong, I'm genuinely sorry. I have nothing but love for everyone. But seriously, y'all gotta stop with the hate and the threats and the harassment, especially when it is coming from a place of lies. Girls from my season spoke a lot of lies about me that have ruined my chances of anything else drag race in the future. Isn't that enough? Ending with a post where she wrote, that's all, and a meme photo uh, saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can show a person the truth but you can't make them think. Hmm. <laughs> 
Let me firstly say though, she is right that the bullying, harassment, and threats all are not ever okay to anyone for any reason. Like that is just the period at the end of that sentence. But what's crazy here to me is how she took this opportunity to basically say, look at what a great person I am. And by the way, no one else from my season did this, suggesting that they didn't do that because they're not good people is crazy. And just completely ignorant of the fact that doing drag at all at any level, is its own form of political protest. And it's great that she went to the Capitol and did these photo ops. Those types of things are very important. But I certainly don't think it's fair or valid to say that people who are not doing this form of political activism are not good people. I guess it's true though, you know what they say, that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And you can show a person the truth, but you can't make him think. But of course, I'd love to know what y'all thought about all this down in the comments below. And now on to our hot goth babes of season six. 16. First up, Plain Jane, who says she's giving hardcore meets Chanel, Gautier, Versace, and I don't know, she named like every major fashion house here, which is a fantasy I live for. Not one that I totally see, but one that I definitely live for. Like, girl, I can absolutely throw on a little black eyeshadow and some silver chains and fully be living my Amy Lee Evanescence goth high fashion fantasy. But on the real note, the detailing in the bows and the metal chain uh, connection pieces all across this bodysuit are really gorgeous, intricately done. And I mean, you can absolutely see the craftsmanship here and the vision she had for this look. And I like this very like Florida drag queen, like I feel like Trinity the Tuck would wear something like this meets Janet Jackson kind of goth fantasy she was going for. This look certainly is hot, but I think she could have pushed the envelope a little further on the darkness in the look. And I think this would have been a great opportunity for her to showcase that she can create a very different silhouette from what she has created in all the design challenges that essentially boils down to decorated, elegant, pretty bodysuit. But then again, I think there can definitely be something said for operating in a safe zone that you know is going to be successful because sometimes those risks do uh, not pay off. So as you all know, I'm a busy bussy queen making multiple digital appearances per week and I don't have time to worry about if my skin's going to be clear when I wake up in the morning. So I don't. And that's thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Curology. I'm thrilled to say I've trusted Curology's simple three-step routine to keep my skin consistently clear for over two years now. And I couldn't be happy with the results. Morning and night, I wash my face with Curology's Acne Cleanser, formulated with benzoyl peroxide to treat and help prevent acne. Effective, but gentle enough for everyday use. At night, I apply my custom formula prescribed to me by a Curology dermatology provider. This is the secret sauce that keeps my skin free of blackheads, clogged pores, and breakouts. And I end my routine with a Curology Rich Moisturizer, formulated with hyaluronic acid and shea butter, giving my skin a soft, silky, smooth appearance. When I first started using Curology, I noticed my breakouts were less frequent frequent and less severe after just a couple of weeks. And over time, I've noticed improvements in my skin's fine lines, tone, and overall texture. Remember though, your results may vary, and Curology isn't a miracle working product, but sticking with my routine has brought a level of consistency to my skin that is truly invaluable. Plus, if anything ever pops up, I just throw on a Curology emergency spot patch and it's gone overnight. Oh, and for all the sunny spring days coming up, don't forget to add the Curology sunscreen into your box. It doesn't clog my pores, it doesn't make me break out, and it just melts beautifully into my skin. You can start your Curology journey today by clicking the link in the description of my video. On their site, you'll take a quick quiz to assess your skincare needs and upload three selfies. Then a dermatology provider will take a look at everything and prescribe you a custom formula and skincare routine to work alongside it. Then use the Curology portal at any time to manage your upcoming shipments, track your skin's progress, and even ask questions to a Curology dermatology provider who's just one click away in the messages tab. Thanks again to Curology for sponsoring today's video and giving me one less thing to worry about every single day. Next up, Maya Iman LePage, who comes out in a really interesting look. Like, I don't know what I was expecting from her gothic presentation, but this was pleasantly surprising. I think the shiny vinyl front with the mermaid skirt was really fun. And then she turns around, she's got this skin tone illusion lacy element to the gown, which is actually, I thought, even better than the front. I think if she had done that full gown in that lace presentation with a bigger train, this really could have turned some heads. She also incorporated some uh, campy gothic details like ravens under her shoulders and spiders crawling up the hem of her dress where those two fabrics meet. And I think one 
Raven, maybe as a fascinator in the hair would have been good enough. But you know, why not three? What is it Coco Chanel said? When you leave the house, look in the mirror and take one Raven off. And look, this really is not bad, but compared to the other looks tonight, it is a rot. But the big drama of this episode is Maya got a lot of help seemingly from Saphira Crystal in the workroom this week. And everyone is noticing what's happening as Saphira is going over to Maya's workstation and giving her stencils, kind of instructing her on what to cut and where to cut. And it was clear she was very in over her head, but I thought it was really nice of Saphira to help her out. I mean, she could have not, she could have just let her suffer but she didn't. And the other queens were seemingly not too happy about this. I mean, personally, if I was not a good seamstress, I, I'm not a good, I'm not even a seamstress. So if I were in the workroom, seeing somebody else who was also not a good seamstress get a bunch of help, I would be a little bitter boots. I would be very jealous. I'd be like, Sapphira, why don't you come help me out too, girl, I need help. But there were a lot of people online debating whether or not what happened between Sapphira and Maya was fair which I don't think is honestly even a valid discussion considering she ended up in the bottom anyways. And as Safira and Maya explained to the judges when they noticed her advancement in sewing skills, saying while Safira gave instruction, help, and advice, the majority of the actual garment building and craftsmanship was Maya's work. Plus Maya is hardly the first person to have a little help in the workroom from another queen. I don't know, I thought that was a weird, thing happening. Next up, it's Dawn, who says she's giving us Chandelier Came to Life with some vintage inspired goth. And I did see that. I definitely immediately got the spooky chandelier in a big giant haunted mansion with a bunch of covered in cobwebs. And it kind of has this styling to it that's very 20s, going into flapper girl and great Gatsby art deco type of feel. And the best part of this look is that deconstructed reverse chandelier hoop skirt thing that is hanging on to the rest of her look by fishing line, hot glue, and a knowledge of fluid dynamics, according to her. And I really am loving how she did her makeup in this look. Like, yes, it has that gothic flair, but it's also more subtle and graphic and defined. It's, it's a good look for her. My issues with the look were really just a personal taste thing. I don't care for the elf ear situation. And I didn't love how the headpiece things were like sticking into her face. And I think a different hair would have been better for me. But those are again, just like really personal taste stuff. And this is a great look. I think it's absolutely. <laughs> and next up, morphine, like the drug, but no sedation. She said no relation in the song, but she should have said no sedation. Morphine, girl, of all the queens, I think that I was impressed with tonight. And I was impressed with a lot of them. I was really impressed with Morphine. Look at the last two looks that she created in the design challenges. Like they were nothing to really sneeze at, but this is a level of attention to detail, styling and construction and craftsmanship that is beyond and shows that, wow, she really wants this. She really wants to be here. She's really trying. And she looks absolutely so stunning in that solid white Gothic makeup. And girl, it's not easy to blend out that solid white and to create shadows and all that stuff. It's not, and made it look damn easy. She looks good. But the actual gown is really cool too. And I think absolutely taps into that Morticia meets high concept artsy runway type of thing. I think all those pleather fins sewn into the black velvet were super smart details that allowed the light to catch the dress in different ways. And that mermaid skirt on this gown is I think one of the best interpretations, creations of a mermaid skirt on a gown we have ever seen on Drag Race. It is so gorgeous how it's layered and ruffled and trains behind her. And sure, like when you zoom in on some details of the gown, there are some small construction issues. Like with the way the fins and spikes don't always come to complete points or are kind of floppy in a way, but like this is pretty crazy for, for a bottom three look. And I think it's absolutely. <laughs> and next up Plasma, who hit the runway in this, which at one point during the episode, I think she describes as Paris Hilton-y. And I can kind of see where she had maybe like a like a Y2K vision for this with the double belts and the, the low rise flare pants. But as Michelle called out during critiques, this look isn't really much of anything. It's a lot of different style references, all mismatched and mixed up into a blender of chaos with a layer of black paint on top. The worst part of this look is that deep U-cut like wrestling singlet bodysuit thing she's got going on, especially with no body on. And she's accessorized her wrestling singlet with, I don't know what that is. It's a jacket, it's a shrug, it's that twirly thing in the car wash. And this actually is the best part of her look. And that's why I did give one hot flame here. It's a really cute jacket. And had she kept that vision for strippies, strappies and everything throughout the look and just presented something cohesive, I think she could have been safe. But instead she completed this look with the low rise flare pants and like a gothic big 
Victorian beaded choker. It's very much giving randomized in the Sim Generator, and I think in that sense we can say it certainly is a unique look. But it's not a good one, and I'm gonna give it a rot. I will say though, it was admirable this year stepping outside of her comfort zone, even if it wasn't ultimately successful. But it seems she only really did this because the other girls were kind of getting her head in the workroom. Plain was asking Plasma if she thought this gothic design runway brief was in her wheelhouse and asked her if she could do anything besides matronly. And we've also got Dawn asking her if she's gonna diversify her looks this week. Plus we have Q getting involved, telling Plasma that the look she's creating is actually similar to some of Plain Jane's sketches. And watching this episode back, seeing her being sent into a tizzy, hearing all of these opinions from everyone around her on what she should or shouldn't be doing for this look, I can understand why the look ended up like it did. And as she acknowledges an untuck, she should have just gone with her gut. And next up, the mother of season 16, it is Safira Kristal, who yes, not only completed her look and went to go help out Maya Amon LePage in her time of need, but also helped out Plasma in her time of need, giving her some much needed encouragement and hugs and friendship when she was not feeling so great about what she was creating. Anyways, Safira's look is incredible. She's very much giving me the bride, but like actually mother of the dead bride. And it was kind of funny to hear her be a little modest about her approach to this goth style, saying that, you know, she's doing it her own way and it may not be exactly what we're expecting, but really she hit the nail on the head as far as goth references go. This is very Lydia Dietz and Beetlejuice classic goth babe. And the gown she's created is absolutely incredible. The construction and shape of it is absolutely insane. That high slit on the side that gushes out into all this like black sparkly tool is really smart. And I love how she perfectly captured that Morticia Elvira drapey sleeve element in this. It's such a great look. And as always, she's giving us a full presentation, which let me just say her range is incredible to have her go from last week dancing around as a majorette to gothic bride funeral director is pretty crazy. This widow just passed go and she is collecting the life insurance policy. This look is hot. Next up, Nymphia Wind, who was again this week playing a little coy in the workroom with the other girls, despite proving time and time again that she is incredible at design challenges. And to a greater extent, anything the judges throw at her. But this look is no exception to the incredible catalog of looks that she has not only brought, but also created on the show so far. She's got this beautiful black veiled spider nest bride situation situation happening on the top. And there's so many elegant details in this look, like the ostrich feathers around the neck and all of the beautiful draping that you really don't see until they zoom in and she's standing still with light coming in the back of her because this look is so black without a lot of contrast in color that you really lose her in some of the moments on the runway. She kind of just looks like a blur of nothing. But when this look is properly lit, it is drop dead gorgeous. And the way that she's created this like reverse teardrop drapey silhouette with her legs coming down to a point is really, really gorgeous. She's kind of giving me um, the Pokemon called Ms. Druvius, I think is how you pronounce it, but as a drag queen. This look is absolutely hot. And I was kind of surprised to hear her getting some negative critiques from Michelle in the vein of her not being happy she couldn't see her face. But I saw the face behind the Black Veil Bride spider nest situation and girl, she had some spooky gothic makeup on that also looks great. I don't think there was anything to complain about here. And finally, you are living for Q. It's cute. Yo, this look is crazy. We have some crazy looks this episode, but she is giving us gothic Victorian doll fantasy. She absolutely is giving that spooky porcelain doll in like the haunted section of the thrift store. I see that. She perfectly captured it. She's got this baby doll dress almost, but it's actually a coat with this huge billowy train behind her that's got a big giant black bow and tons of smaller little black bows everywhere. I mean, the details on this are absolutely insane. Like it's really crazy to me that somebody with this level of skin skill in creating a garment from conception to execution is just casually competing on Drag Race. And she makes like most all of her looks from what I understand. Girl, the craftsmanships, the theatrics, the level of drama in her looks is unlike anything we've ever seen on Drag Race. And in the same way that Nymphia is this very high fashion take on drag, Q is a very theatrical and dramatic take on it. I will say though, I don't personally like the style 
of this look she's created. It's just not something I gravitate towards. I much prefer, I think, a more traditional, fashion-y, high concepts type of look like Nymphia presented on the runway tonight. But I'm certainly not going to sit here and not absolutely give her applause and flowers for her artistic vision and creation, because it really, truly is incredible. And as it turns out, the sad, sad tears of the gothic porcelain doll in the corner of the thrift store are indeed and the win this episode does go to Q, rightly deserved, but I also could very much have seen justification for Sephira or Nymphia winning this challenge. All three of them had such an incredible and unique take to this neo-goth brief that, as Plain Jane said on Twitter, like, we should just be lucky we as viewers get to see the level of talent and ability to create these garments across our set of queens in all their different ways, forms, and fashions. We're lucky, right? Because we've also had seasons where the pinnacle of a design challenge is gluing cookie cutters to a bathing suit. Not that we need to name names, but congrats to Q and really everyone on this challenge. And our bottom two is exactly who you would expect looking at this lineup, Maya and Plasma. And I did react to this lip sync and runway over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen, which you can get access to by clicking the link in the description of my video. But before we break down the actual lip sync, we have to talk about that abomination of a song that was the chipmunk version of Bloody Mary by Lady Gaga. Like what was that? They were calling it, I think the, the TikTok version or something. And I'm like, girl, there is a reason I don't use TikTok. And this is the reason, not even the 13th reason, just one of the reasons. But despite this complete butchering of what is really a beautiful Gaga song, the lip sync was incredible. It was a frantic mess from start to finish where we have Maya giving ballroom and Vogue doing a black rose petal reveal beneath her wig where yes, she should have had another wig underneath or even really just shown her natural braids and taken the beanie off. But we did have that. And we also had Plasma giving a little nod to some Lady Gaga choreo in some moments and doing some drops and falling onto the floor. And I don't think you could say that these queens were not both lip syncing for their lives. But Maya, the range, the absolute range of this queen to hit the bottom three again for the third time and not just lip sync her way out of the bottom, defeating Plasma, but doing it in a style that was different from the first and second times she was in the bottom. All three bottom three performances have been different, but Maya's incredible lip sync here does mean that we are losing Plasma, somebody who's got two wins under her belt and who hasn't otherwise really slipped up. And in that sense, does it really hurt to see a contestant who's doing so well in the competition go home because they didn't succeed at a design challenge? Sure. But personally, I think it's nice to really feel like the lip syncs are counting this season. Even though some people online were saying, well, look at what happened with Q and Amanda. Amanda won the lip sync, but ended up going home. But looking back at that lip sync and comparing it to this one, I would say the Q and Amanda one felt a lot closer and justifiable in either direction, just kind of depending on your performance preferences. Whereas in this one, it was very obviously a complete slaughter on the side of Maya Amon LePage. And regarding the outcome of this lip sync, it was really nice nice to see both Plasma and Q come to the defense of their sister Maya on the platform called X, formerly known as Twitter, writing. It's so weird how y'all would just come on here to sit on us. Sit on me for winning, sit on Queen of Flips, Maya, for staying. I'm just so tired, y'all. And don't you dare come for my sis, Queen of Flips. Full stop, that's my sister for life. But as always, I'd love to know what y'all thought in the comments down below. And finally, for Hottest Hot, I'm gonna give it to... Y'all, I really can't decide this week. Like, Sephira's was the best drag interpretation, Nymphia's was the best high fashion interpretation, and Q's was the best theatrical craftsmanship attention to detail interpretation. Just so incredible in their different ways. But if I had to live with one for the rest of my life, or like what I personally would wear, I would go with Nymphia Wind. And of course, I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hots and they too voted for Nymphia Wind. And I wanna give one more thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Curology. Curology is without a doubt the easiest and most effective skincare I've ever used. And did I mention it's shipped right to my doorstep so I never have to worry about running out of product? They really did think of everything, didn't they? And finally, I wanna give an extra special shout out to Ashley Brungart, Child Free Mateau, Dorothy Hall, Fa Visha, Matthew Burns, Sexy Winnie the Blue, Steven Topher, and Will and Tana, who are all supporting me at my Bussy Queen Collector tier at Patreon.com. See y'all later. Love ya.